Um, okay, so here we have par the parsha in a nutshell. God instructs Noah, the only righteous man in a world consumed by violence and corruption, to build a large wooden teva, an ark, coated within and without with pitch. A great del deluge, says God, will wipe out <clears throat> all life form from the face of the earth, but the ark will float upon the water, sheltering Noah and his family, and two members, male and female, of each animal species, and seven of the pure species. Pure means the kosher animals. Rain falls, um, rain falls 40 days and nights, and the waters chum for 150 days more before calming and beginning to recede. The ark settles on Mount Ararat, and Noah dispatches a raven and then a series of doves to see if the waters were abated from the face of the earth. When the ground dries completely exactly one solar year, 365 days after the onset of the flood, God commands Noah to exit the Teva, the ark, and repopulate the earth. Give me just one moment, please. Somebody's asking for the link. Um, Okay, um, Noah builds an altar and offers sacrifices to God. God swears never again to destroy all of mankind because of their deeds and sets the rainbow as testimony of his new covenant with man. God also commands Noah regarding this, this sac the sacredness of, of life. Murder is deemed a capital offense. And while man is permitted to eat the meat of animals, he is forbidden to eat flesh of, or blood taken from a living animal. So that's sort of the conclusion of the story of the flood. We read about uh, the the, um, the rainbow testimony that there won't be any more flood, and then the idea that these are permitted to eat meat. Noah plants a vineyard and becomes and becomes drunk on its produce. Two of Noah's sons, Shem and Yafet, are, ble are are blessed for covering up their father's nakedness, while the third son, Ham, is punished for taking advantage of his de debasement. The descendants of Noah remain in a, sing a single people with a single language and culture for 10 generations. Then they defy their creator by building a great tower to symbolize their own invincibility. God confuses their languages so that one does not comprehend the tongue of the other, causing them to abandon their project and disperse across the face of the earth, splitting into 70 nations, otherwise known as the Tower of Babel, one of the very, very strange story of the Torah. Hopefully we'll have some time. We'll discuss that today as well. The portion of Noah concludes with the chrono chronology of the 10 generations from Noah to, Ab to Avram, later Avraham. In other words, his name was changed at the end of next parsha, And the and latter's journey from his birthplace to Ur Kasdim, from Ur Kasdim to Haran, um, on the way to the land of Canaan. So what do we have here so far? We have the commandment to build the ark, the building of the ark, the flood, the last for 40, the rain falls for 40 days, then, then it falls, for that, then, then, then the water, and then the water is on the earth for, for a full year. We read about Noah sending the birds, which is a one, a strange story. We read about Noah building an altar and offering offerings and God sort of making an oath that he will no longer bring a flood, which brings other questions, which is um, if the flood wasn't, uh, if God decides never again to be, bring a flood, why did he bring it into the first, in the first place? Um, we read about the story of Noah planting the vineyard and the Tower of Babel. So we have a little bit what to talk about if we run out of things. So that's the good news. Um, I just want to begin by looking at the beginning of the Parsha, which is what we usually do. But I also want to um, maybe look at the end of last Parsha, because the end of last Parsha is what, what gets us to um, what gets us to the discussion of how humanity really uh, descends. So, be just a moment. We'll look at the end of last parsha. Do this. Sheet. Okay, so this is the last. This is last week's parsha. The end. Of, the end of 
chapter, the end of the portion of Bereshit of Genesis. And we always talk about that the Jewish division of the, the way the Jews divide traditionally, the way the tradition divides the portions is not necessarily the way the chapters divide. And again, here's you're going to see a case in point where the story of the destruction of man, which is the last couple of verses of last week's parsha, begins a new chapter. Um, the way the Jews divide it, no, that's all last week, and this week starts with the mention of Noah. So I'll, we'll point it out, uh, maybe. We'll see. So Genesis chapter 6, and it came to pass when man commenced to multiply upon the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. That the sons of the nobles saw the daughters of man when they were beautifying themselves, and they took for themselves wives from whomever they chose. Rashi says, taking from whoever they chose is basically abducting other people's wives, and that's the beginning of the corruption. And the Lord said, let my spirit not quarrel forever concerning man, because he is also flesh, and his days shall be 120 years. According to Rashi, what that means is that God says he's going to wait 120 years to see if humanity could shape up. If not, there will be destruction. The Nephilim, which is the giants, were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of the nobles would come to the daughters of man, and they would bear to them, for them, they are the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. And the Lord saw that the evil of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of his heart was only evil all the time. And the Lord regretted that he had made man upon the earth, and he became grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I created from upon the face of the earth, from man to cattle to creeping thing to the fowl of the heavens, for I regret that I, have, that I made them. Which is an astonishing statement. It almost sounds like heretical. How does God regret Regret. We regret because when we do something, we don't realize the consequences of our actions, so we regret. But what is it? How could you say God regrets? So there's a fascinating Rashi, which I want to point out. It's a very interesting Rashi, and Rashi talks about a conversation between a heretic and one of the Talmudic sages. So let's read that. Okay. Um, and he became grieved. So God was saddened. Again, why does God sad because of what he did? We, I do, I, I'm sad because I make a mistake. But God should know the consequences of his actions. So why is God sad? And says Rashi as follows. And he became grieved. Hebrew by Itatsev. He mourned over the destruction of his handiwork. I, according to the second view, by Itatsev refers to God. Okay. The king is sad and nets up over his son. So that, in other words, we're talking about the word Atsev, saddened. Fine. Says Rashi, this I wrote to refute the heretics. A Gentile asked Rabbi Yeshua ben Karcha. Rabbi Yeshua ben Karcha is one of the Talmudic sages. So a Gentile asked him, do you admit that the Holy One, blessed be he, foresees the future? Does God know the future? He, Rabbi Yeshua, replied to him, yes. So he retorted, the heretic retorted, responded, but it is written and he became grieved in his heart. He quoted this verse in Genesis chapter 6, verse uh, 6. So how could you say God knows everything if you're telling me that God was saddened that he made man? So what did Rabbi Yeshua answer? He, Rabbi Yeshua, replied, was a son ever born to you? Yes, he, the Gentile, replied. What did you do? He, Rabbi Yeshua, asked. He, Rabbi Yeshua, asked. He replied, I rejoiced and made everyone rejoice. I had a son. I made a party. So then Rabbi Yeshua asked him, but did you not know that he was destined to die? You have a son. Eventually, no one's going to live forever, right? Eventually, your son is going to die, right? So why are you so happy? Why are you celebrating the birth of a child if at the end, the ending might not, might, may, may not be as happy? So he, the Gentile, replied, at the time of joy, joy, the time of mourning, mourning. That's life. Just because later something is going to be a problem doesn't mean every moment of life, every moment of joy, you should embrace it and celebrate it. He, Rabbi Yeshua, said to him, so it is with the work of the Holy One, blessed be he. Same as with Hashem. Even though it was revealed before him that they would ultimately sin and he would destroy them, he did not refrain from creating them for the sake of the righteous men who were destined to arrive, arise from them. That's from the Genesis Rabbah. So it's a beautiful metaphor, right? So in other words, when the verse says that God uh, um, regretted and he was saddened by, based of, by, by his actions that he created a human being, that is not, on the surface, it seems like that that's a theological problem because how could how could God not, not predict the future? No, God predicts the future. So he, but, but at the moment of joy is joy. Later they may sin. We'll deal with that later. But right now, there's righteous people. There's righteous moments. 
You have to embrace every moment of joy of life. So that's the, that's 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 with the with the question of of how God was saddened by what happened, or he seems like he was surprised. But then there's a very beautiful verse at the end of so verse seven is again God says I'm going to wipe everything out. Verse seven, verse eight is a beautiful verse. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Okay. So already last week, when you, oh, I didn't share it. Okay, I have to share it. Already last week, when you read these terrible verses of verse five and six and seven, that God wants to destroy everything, you get to verse eight. And it says, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So you already have a hint of positivity to come. That was the last, last sentence of last week's parsha. Now we're going to jump to the first sentence of this week's parsha, new parsha. Like I said, the division of chapters, which was not a div Jewish division, continues this story because, yeah, we're talking about Noah, so we're going to continue. No, but the Jewish division is not last week was last week, this week is different. This week is two different stories. And why that's important, I'm going to try to point it out in a minute. Comes this week's parsha. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Okay. Um, introducing Noah. These, this is what happened with Noah. These are, this is, these are the generations with Noah. He's a perfect man. He's complete in his generations. Everyone knows what that, you know, the famous Talmud of dispute of what that means, but we'll leave that alone for right now. And then Noah had three sons and then everything comes corrupt and etc. And God tells Noah, I want to bring a flood, build, build, build an ark. Okay. What's, my, what's the point here? What is, my, what is the point here? Um, the last verse of Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, what is it doing in last week's parsha? Shouldn't verse 8 and 9 be in the same parsha? We're talking about how great Noah is. So say Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And then you say um, Noah was a righteous man, complete in his generations. So in other words, we're talking about Noah. You're praising Noah. Put it all together. No. Last week, we talk about Noah was found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's all we say about Noah. And then this parsha, we say, oh, Noah was a perfect man, was, was, was a righteous man, perfect in his generations. In other words, it's introducing sort of a new story. Why the division is the first question we want to ask. And I'm not just asking it as a technicality, but I'm going to try to show how that real division really influences how we think about the world in general the world pre-flood and post-flood. So let's talk about this for a second. What does it mean Noah found favor in the eyes of God? Finding favor. What does finding favor mean? When you have, favor, let's say, favoritism, or when you favor, it's almost like it's hard to quantify. It's not something that is objective. It's much more subjective. It's something that's considered beautiful to you. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. It's not something that the person did. So if you want to compare the last verse of last week's parsha. And the first verse of this week's parsha, last week's parsha says, Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Wonderful. What did he do? What did he do to earn it? Doesn't say. It's the perspective of Hashem. Hashem finds favor. Hashem likes Noah. Okay. What does it say in this week's parsha? It talks about what Noah did on his own. It doesn't talk about the gift that God gave him. It talks about what Noah, it doesn't talk about the gift that God gave him, how he found favor in the eyes of God. We talk about what Noah did on his own. He was a righteous man, perfect in his generations. He walked with God. Okay. So now I ask you, how come uh, the, the Christians were wrong to divide, to, to put them all together, to put chapter nine, oh, sorry, to put chapter six and put all the stories of Noah in one, which is what they did? We say no. Stop after, stop what seems to be in middle, right? Seems to be in middle. We're stopping. We're, 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 we're stopping in the middle of the story of Noah. We just introduced Noah last week's parsha in verse eight, and we say Noah um, found favor in the eyes of God. And then we say, "Oh, stop! New verse, new parsha." Logically, you may think it's chapter six, verse nine. It's just the middle of a chapter. No, because verse nine. These are the generations of Noah. Noah is a righteous man. Is a new Noah. It's a new discussion. We're not talking about the gift that Noah gets from above that God that, that God likes him for whatever reason. But we're emphasizing what Noah did. We're emphasizing the human effort. Okay, so we have to divide it. But what's really happening here is that there's a greater story. And if you think about this for a second, it's very strange. God created the world. The human being really had no input in creation. When was human being created? He wasn't created day one. He was created day six. 
And the Talmud makes the point that the human being was created after everything else. When the human being was created, everything in the world was already prepared. And the Talmud brings the metaphor that if you have a guest, when are you going to invite the guest? You have Thanksgiving's coming up soon. So when are you going to invite the guest? Well, I don't know how they do it for Thanksgiving. But you're not going to invite the guest to prepare the food, to the food to go shopping and to go preparing. You invite the guest to come when everything is prepared. So Adam and Eve arriving on the scene and the sixth day of creation, Friday afternoon, everything is done. And Rashi quotes the Medrash, which uses the metaphor, everything is ready for the meal. Everything is ready. Beautiful. What does man do? What is man's participation? Zero. Okay. What happens? You give man a gift of the world. What does he do? If he didn't work for it, the world becomes corrupt. The world is destroyed. Why? Man was not, did not participate. God created the world and man destroys it. So what's really happening here in, number, in, in, the second, in, in, part, in the second portion of the Torah, it's almost like, okay, let's do it again. But this time, man is involved in the recreation of the world. God tells Noah, make an ark. And you have to build the ark. And you have to collect the animals. And you have to feed them. Right? God could have just sent the pandemic and wiped out all the bad guys. No. The point here is to see what is no, what we have to get Noah involved in the process of saving and then ultimately rebuilding the world. And when humanity gets involved in building the project, then the project is so much more valuable to it. And therefore, some pe at least some people say, okay, we have to preserve this. We care about this project. It wasn't gifted to us. If it's gifted to you, okay, your kid, your kid gets a gift. He doesn't like to destroy it. But if he earned it, no, no, it's much more precious. If it was involved through the child's own effort, then the person is going to, then the child or the person or the adult in this case is going to say, okay, you have to be much more careful because what is gifted, you can, you can lose. What is earned, you, you're, you, you have skin in the game. You're much more invested. And that's essentially what's happening here. The whole Bereshi, the whole last week's portion culminating in Noah found favor in the eyes of God, which has nothing to do with what Noah did. It was the gifts he got. So the first portion is all about the gifts that we got from above. God spoke to us. God creates the world, creates the Garden of Eden. None of this is going to last because until you get the human being to invest, until you get the human being to work and appreciate and participate in the process of rebuilding, um, um, it's not going to work. You know, you can't get the kids to clean the house. It's a big problem. Uh, one day, yeah, they, they, had, they had cousins come over and they cleaned the basement, mazel tov, they cleaned the basement. It's, not, it's, it's a big deal. It doesn't happen often. For weeks, they made sure the basement was kept clean. Why? Because if the parents clean the basement or the cleaning lady cleans the basement, they don't care. They can make a mess. But if they clean the basement, oh, no, no, you, can, you can't put out a toy without putting it back. Right? So that's, that's, really, a, that's a really a metaphor, what's happening here. And that's why time, um, um, second time around, second time around, God tells Noah, okay, we have a problem here. We have a world that's corrupt. We need your help. We need your input. You got to build the ark. You have to take in the animals. You are part of the solution. You're not just someone who, who is going to be gifted um, the new reality, and that's what, and that's what, and, and that's, and that's why, and that's perhaps why the world now changes. And God says, no more flood, because we're not going to need a flood, because there's always going to be some people who understand and take responsibility for uh, the, the, the spiritual state of the world. Why? Because humanity is invested. And if humanity is invested, if we help build, then we're going to, then, then it's much more valuable for us. So that is just a way of introduction to give us into, so get us into the parsha which it's just, it's just astonishing. You take the bird's eye view. The first time God creates, it fails. The second time, um, um, the second time you have, um, uh, this, in some ways, a re repeat of the story of creation, a reversal and then repeat of the story of creation. I'll talk, I'll talk about what that means. All of a sudden, now it lasts because the human being is involved. What do I mean that there's a reversal of the story of creation? If you follow the story, you could see in some sense, there's the reverse. You have a six days of creation, not... 100% perfect, but there's a, re, there's a repeat of the, of the six days of creation in this week's Parsha, because the Torah describes how the flood comes about, and then all the mountains are covered with water, and there's rain, and there's water from below. What does that remind you of? Day two. Day two, there's the God divides the, the waters between the waters that are in the heaven and the waters that are, that are on earth, okay? Then what happens? As the water recedes, the dry land appears. You read that in Genesis, but you also read it in this week's Parsha. The tops of the mountains are exposed because the water recedes. Okay, now you have earth. Okay, 
What happens next? Next, you get this whole story about birds. No, Ach sends the birds to see if it's dry. What do I need to hear about birds? Oh, what's the next day? We're skipping day four. Day five is introduction of fish and birds. Again, so in the story, you have fish and birds. You have birds. And then what happens? Um, and, and then what happens? Ultimately, the human being could emerge. So in some sense, the pattern of going from water to dry land to, ve to, 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 to vegetation, because the birds are going out to see if there's vegetation. Day three is vegetation. Then there's birds. The birds are going to see if there's vegetation. And then ultimately, you, the human being, man and woman, emerge. And God repeats to, to Adam and Eve, to, to Noah and his wife, what he told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. So in some sense, if you could think about it, you could think about Noah as a repeat of the story of creation. But this time it's going to last. Why is it going to last? Because the human being is involved. I mean, this is a lesson in so many areas of life that uh, you want the basement to stay clean, get your kids to clean it. No, that's only one metaphor. But there's so many other examples that when we are built, when we build, when we invest, when we take responsibility, then, then, then it lasts. What is gifted to us from, from God is a wonderful thing. We find grace in the eyes of God. God gives us gifts, but the gifts we get from God are not ultimately what's meaningful. What's meaningful is what we create on our own. As we say, Noah was a righteous man, uh, perfect in his generations. With God, he walked with God. That represents what did he do beyond the gift that God gave him. Okay, that's introduction, 25 minute introduction. Now we can start, now we can start with the Parsha. And um, we read about the Parsha. So we talk about the different dimensions and the flood, and there's so much to say, but I'm going to say what I say every year. So excuse me for four minutes to say what I say every year, but you cannot say it. Um, the Baal Shem Tov, founder of the Hasidic movement, had a beautiful teaching on this story of the Ark and the story of the flood, in a sense. And of course, everything we learn in the Torah is not just ancient history. So we're not talking about a, a biblical flood that happened 4,000 years ago. But in some sense, we're talking about the flood that could reoccur in everybody's life. And at some point or another, there are worries, there are, there's an anxiety, there's, uh, there's difficulties that swarm our life or our mind or our consciousness and threaten to overtake us. And everybody's going to face the flood of worry or anxiety at some point in, or another in their life. And... What the Baal Shem Tov says is everybody is going to experience a flood. And then what do you do if you have a flood? So you have to make an ark and you have to find protection. The beautiful idea of the Baal Shem Tov is that the Hebrew word for teva, the Hebrew word for, the Hebrew word for ark, which is teva, um, means an ark, a box. But in biblical Hebrew, which is absolutely fascinating, and I think Mark is here, I think, and Mark likes these connections, that in biblical Hebrew, the word teva, the word, the word for the word that we translated as ark, means an ark. But the more common word for teva is the word word, like a word. I'm speaking a word. That's what teva is. A teva is a word. It's also a box. And this week, in this context, and in this week's parsha, it's only used as box. But if you stop, in a, if you if you if if, if you if you stop a, 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 a biblical a speak a, a speaker of biblical Hebrew and say what's a teva, chances are more likely they're going to say unless they know about the teva the teva of Noah the ark of Noah is famous. But the context of teva the word teva means means a word. Um, says the Baal Shem Tov. If because everybody is going to experience a flood in their life, because there's worries, because there are thoughts uh, that that keep coming at you. What you have to do is do what God tells Noah. You have to enter the ark. But instead of enter the ark, what the verse says is come to the, enter the word. What does it mean, enter the word? Enter the words of prayer and Torah study. And every day you have to enter the ark because you have to um, create a haven, a spiritual haven, an anchor, a psychological space where you're reconnected to spirituality and to God and to, and to faith. And that's your ark and that's your haven. And once you do that, you're not supposed to stay in the ark the entire day, right? A lot of the story, by the way, we don't think about this because we're always talking about the first half of the story, but a lot of the, a lot of the story is how do you get out of the ark? And the Baal Shem Tov said, just like there's a commandment to enter the ark, which is every day to create a space, especially in the beginning of the day, start the day by entering the protective haven of words, words of prayer, words of Torah study. There's also a commandment later in the parsha: "Seimin hateva, emerge from the ark." You can't lock yourself all day in a room and say and study and pray, but you have to go out to the world and affect the world. So both of those are important. But when you go into the ark, then you have a, a space 
that gives you, connects you to holiness to God. And then when you go out of the ark, the ark is not, the, the, go out of the ark, the flood is no longer there. The flood is no longer threatening because you're anchored in your, in your connection to Hashem. So that's the beautiful interpretation of the, of the Baal Shem Tov. And that is every day we have to enter the ark, which is enter the words of prayer and st Torah study, because that protects us from our internal and external, the floods, the worries, the difficulties, either they're objective or subjective, real or imagined, uh, um, um, real problems or just worries about problems. But whatever the case is, they're all included in the waters of the flood that seek to drown us. And what we have to do is we have to find uh, time every day to enter those words of prayer and study to enter the ark. And then we could emerge from the ark. That's a beautiful interpretation. That itself is enough to, to, to celebrate. We can think about it and go home and it's going to change our life. Then you have an additional interpretation. So two generations later, the disciple of the Baal Shem Tov was the Magid of Mezrich. And the Magid himself had, Baal Shem Tov had many students. And the Magid had many students. One of the students of the, but, but, but after the Baal Shem Tov passed, the Magid was still, there still, was still one leader to the Hasidic movement. And all the great Hasidic masters studied and, and, and received Torah from the Magid. After the Magid passed away, then the Hasidic movement sort of breaks out into many, many branches. And one of the branches is, of course, the Chabad Hasidism. And the founder of the Chabad Hasidism is Rabbi Shneir Zalman and of the Yadi, author of the Tanya. And he wrote a book called Torah Or, which is a commentary on the Torah. And when he explains this week's Parsha, beautiful, beautiful discourse, he quotes the Baal Shem Tov in a sense. They have to enter the words of, the, of Torah and prayer. Yes, okay. And then he adds a very, deep, a very powerful dimension. He says, it's not just that when we enter the ark, we are protecting ourselves from the waters of the flood. So we enter this words of Torah and prayer. It's here to protect us from all our worries. Because then, then, then I'd say, I'd rather have no worries, right? God, why does God create the worries to drown me? And then I need an ark, so I shouldn't drown. Says, says, the, says, the, says the author, I have a beautiful concept. He says, look, he says, if you look carefully at the verses, and there's one verse in particular that he points out, which I want to point out, which I want to show you because it's so beautiful. Verse uh, Genesis chapter 7, verse 17. Now the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and they lifted the ark, and it rose off the earth. If you don't know the context of the story, I just tell you this beautiful verse. You're lifting up, you're going off the verse, off the earth. You're being raised from the earth. Says Rabbi Shneir Zalman, if you go into the words of prayer and study, but you're escaping from you're going into the ark, the words of prayer and study, but you're escaping from the worries. You're escaping from the negativity. What happens is not just that you're protected from the negativity, but actually the negativity that's out there actually increases the passion and the devotion that you have to Hashem. In other words, the waters of the flood that you thought are here to drown you are actually here to raise your ark, to raise your prayer and Torah study, right? Because the commitment to God and the connection to God is intensified by overcoming the negative thoughts and the, neg and, the, and, the ne and the negative emotions. So you have this tension in your life of the negativity, of the worries. And then when you take that tension and focus it and say, I'm escaping that, I'm going to connect to God, even though it's difficult, that produces a much deeper connection to God. And therefore, what's really happening is, so the two, there's two steps. The first step is the Baal Shem Tov taught if you don't want to drown from the worries, build an ark, build words of prayer and Torah study, enter your ark, enter that spiritual haven and spiritual environment that you create for yourself. Okay, that's you protected yourself. Then Rabbi Shneir Zalman takes it much, a much step deeper. Once you enter the ark, you realize that the waters that you thought are here to drown you are really here to lift you up. And that is, um, and that is, and that is the concept of, and that is the concept of the water raising the ark, raising the word. Yes, right? Roberta is asking, um, between the Ark of the Covenant and Noah's Ark, the same word, Teva. Yes. So the word for the Ark of the Covenant, yes. So in Hebrew, 
it's actually interesting. So, so, so Roberta's saying that you have the word for the Ark of the Covenant and you have the Ark of Noah. So is there a connection? So I'm happy to make a connection. I'll do it in a second. But it so happens to be that in biblical Hebrew, it's not called the same thing. Because like I said, um, the Ark, the word Teva for an Ark is not the common word. A teva is usually word. We found the way to say teva is also a box. Teva can also be a box. So in Hebrew, you have the teva of Noah, and then you have the Aaron Brit Hashem, the Ark of the Covenant, two different words. Teva is not for Noah, and Aaron is for the Ark. In English, it's the same. Um, in Hebrew, it's two separate things. So like I said, we're looking for a word that has multiple meanings, and according to the Valshanta, we're looking for a word that, that also means word. But connecting to what you're saying in the English, if they're related, and obviously related, everything's by divine providence. So first of all, yes, the ark is the Torah. The Torah is your spiritual ark, is the spiritual haven that creates that uh, that creates that environment for you that 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 protects you. I would also say that you say the covenant. There's a covenant which is the which is the covenant with the Jewish people that we get at the Torah. But there's also a covenant that God creates with humanity, which is in this week's parsha after the ark of Noah. The, the, the rainbow, the Torah refers to the rainbow as Zot Otabrit. This is, this is the sign of the covenant. So there is a covenant with the Torah, that's specifically for the Jewish people, and there's a covenant with uh, humanity, and that's what we read about in, in the story of Noah. So there's a lot more to say, but yes, I'm just touching upon just getting our feet wet. Go ahead, Vicky. Thank you, Rabbi. My question was about the metaphor um for for the for the ark the, the first metaphor that was brought up by founder of Hasidic movement oh, of Hasidic movement right there was yes. the ra there was um ra uh, not raising uh, protecting right protecting, protecting. Yeah. Yeah. and yeah. when you said the additional metaphor the first metaphor that comes to mind is also navigating so not only protecting not only raising but as far as the location of the ark did we land at the same place or is it actually helping navigate? It, 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 does anybody talk about that? That's a good question. We talk about how high the ark went. The ark went above all the mountains. Um, I believe it raised 15 cubits over the mountains. 15 is significant. Um, letters of Hashem's name, yud Hey. We can talk about that if you want. Um, I haven't seen much more on that, on, specifically on this topic, but uh, that's what we, again, not everything is spelled out to give room, give space for us to participate, right? Not everything can be handed down. Some of it we have to uh, figure out on our own. That's part of the story here. So I think you could think about raising higher than all the mountains, how high it raises 15. I don't know if the navigation was that was that was the point, because we're not navigation is more like, uh, um, space, you know, breath. How, where do you want to go on earth? We're referring to, I think, at least in this context, how high you can go off the earth, how close you can come to Hashem. Right, what the what the Baal Shanta would call dvekut, cleaving to God. So there, it's going upward, and yet, and that earth. If I, if I didn't, if I just, if I just take, if I just take that verse and I say the ark or the word was raised from upon the earth, and I show you that verse out of context, I go to some uh, um, 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 uh, some spiritual seeker in the east, and I say, isn't this a beautiful verse? They say, yeah, wow, we're getting raised from the earth, and we're coming close to God. I say, yeah, and how do you do that? They say, oh, we go to a monastery, we lock the doors for 13 years. But what the Baal Shem Tov, what the Alter Rebbe is saying, you know how you get close to God? When there is the water seeking to drown you, and you can find it within yourself to create that haven, then when you finally got away from the worry and you focused on words of prayer and study, now you appreciate that connection to God so much more, now you're lifted up from the ground. And without going too, too far, the, 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 Rabbi Shneir Zalmadir says that there's a big mistake, big mistake amongst his students, because the, the, his students thought that the people that study Torah all day, they could be more mystical and spiritual, and they could pray with greater passion. And he said, no. He said, the people who are out in the world doing business and doing commerce, and all week they're distant, they can pray on Shabbat with a much greater intensity than the people who never, who never left, left the study hall. Why? Because they have more flood. They have more worry. And the more water you have in your life, the higher your ark will be raised, which is, which is, which is actually so counterintuitive. And it's, it's, it's actually beautiful. I would never expect, expect Rabbi Shneir Zama to say that. 
The more worry you have during the week, the more you can enjoy Shabbat. The more worry you have during the day, the more when you when you when if you do this right, you have to enter the ark, which is an avoda, it's a service to block everything out, build a build a space, and say I'm putting everything aside, and right now I'm focusing only on my connection to God for this ten seconds, or thirty seconds, or sixty seconds. If you can go into that psychological space, then you're going to go in there with so much more intensity because you need it more. And you're running away from the distance that you appreciate the serenity of the moment. And you appreciate the connection to God in a much deeper way. So I'm not saying it's easy to enter the ark. But if you can get into the ark, your ark is going to be raised. And it's going to be raised higher than the person who never really had to go into the ark because there was no water. No, not that the water is coming to drown and weren't that much. It was just a little bit flood on the ground. Right? There's no tsunami. Yeah, tsunami is, is, is you know, you have the people who, who like to surf. So there's a whole thing. They track, they chase the waves. I said, me chase the waves. I run away from the waves. I hear there's a little bit of wave. I, I run for my life. No, but some people, if you know how to ride the wave, you chase the wave because you understand the bigger the wave, the higher you go. So I'm not saying we should worry, worry we should chase uh, trouble and chase uh, uh, um, worries and chase anxiety. That, that, that would be a mistake. But if they catch you, learn to ride the wave. Understand, make yourself an ark and ride the wave, and then it will lift you higher than the guy who never saw the wave. So that right. is, um, yeah. that's a little bit about, about that metaphor, yeah. So that's why the people who go back to the to the world will appreciate the navigation system to navigate, not only race, because right. you appreciate when we, when you raised, but you also, when you go into the world, you will appreciate. I think the navigation is a separate skill. When I'm in the world, I'm, I'm in a separate skill. Now I have to move, now I have to move, uh, uh, um, you know, to the breath, not up and down, but I have to go sort of horizontal. And that's a different skill. That's an earth skill. The water is connected to the heaven. Even the word shamayim is shamayim. There, there's water. Water is a way of covering over the earth, sort of covering the distinctions. In general, in Kabbalah, water, water, water even the second verse of the Torah, Baruch Elohim, the spirit of God is above the water. When you see water, you don't see creation. You sort of, you see the overarching light. So when we talk about water, it's about the connection to Hashem. Once you have that, you come off the earth. Now you have to navigate the earth. But then you need some navigation system. You need Abraham. You need, you need Noach. Noach does, doesn't do such a great job of coming back. Abraham does a better job. Okay, so there's a lot more to say about that. But, but, but uh, yeah, I think that's a separate skill. But, but still the connection to Hashem helps in that. Yes, of course, of course, of course. And the ark landed at the same place where where it was raised from. Not necessarily. The ark, uh, we don't know for sure. We know the ark landed in Mount Ararat. I'm not sure exactly where that is. Some people think it's Turkey. Some people think they do know or they don't know. But uh, there's no indication that it was exactly where it was built. I I I, I don't uh, I don't know if it was exactly where it was built. Um, they had to travel a little bit from Ararat to Babel to Babylonia to make the ark to make the tower because the tower was sort of in there tower was was in Babel, was in Iraq, but there's no mountains there. It's just a valley. And we know the, the and we know that the that the ark landed on top of the mountain. So that that that's 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 so there was some movement, but Turkey and 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 and, and Iraq are obviously pretty close. Okay. A lot more to say on the parsha, but we I think we should jump to the end of the parsha because we always get stuck on the earlier sections. So I want to do a little bit of the Tower of Babel which is probably one of the most cryptic stories in the Torah, because you read the story, well, maybe we'll do an exercise. I'm going to read the verse, and you'll stop me when you think there was a sin. And it's not clear what the sin is. It sounds like what the people are doing is very noble, and God is very offended by the idea of unity, um, which is totally strange. Um, but we'll, we'll go in there, and we'll, see, and we'll see what we can make of it. And then if we have time, we'll go to other stories as well. But we'll start from the end. We did the beginning, now, we're going to, now we'll go to the end. So I'm turning to this week's Parsha. Let's find it. Um, okay, seventh reading, Genesis chapter 11. Okay, I'm going to read it. We'll see what happens. Tell me if you could see any sin here. Now the entire earth was of one language and uniform words. Varim achadim, one words, um, maybe means one language. And it came to pass when they traveled from the east that they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, "Come, let us make bricks and fire and fire them thoroughly." So the bricks were, on, were, were to them for stones, and the clay was to them for mortar. 
And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top on the heavens, and let us make ourselves a name, lest we become scattered upon the face of the earth. If you have a big tower, and everyone knows the tower, and everyone has, and the tower has a good name, no one's going to want to scatter. Everyone will live together. Seems to me that living together is a noble idea. And the Lord descended, verse 5, and the Lord descended. And the Lord descended to see the city and the tower that the sons of man have built. And the Lord said, lo, they are one people, and they all have one language. And this is what they have commenced to do. Now, will it not be withheld from them all that they have planned to do? Oh, they're united. Now they're powerful. Now they can do whatever they want to do. Terrible. We have to stop the plan right away. What happened? So come, let us descend and confuse their language so that one will not understand the language of his companion. And the Lord scattered from there upon the face of the entire earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, he named it Babel, Babel, for there the Lord confused, the word Babel, Liblo, Balal, is to mix up, to confuse. There the Lord confused the language of the entire earth, and from there, the Lord scattered them upon the face of the entire earth. That is the strange story of the Tower of Babel. So, what's so bad? What do they do wrong? So, let's see what the rabbis do. The rabbis say, oh, it's terrible. They really want to do something bad. They wanted to fight God. Uh, it's a wonderful theory, but is it actually alluded to in the verses? So let's look at, let's, let's read Rashi. Um, where is it? Oh, let's read, let's read the first Rashi. So now the entire earth was one, was one language and, and uniform words. One language, the holy tongue. They all spoke Hebrew. Okay. Uniform words. They came with one scheme and said, he has no right to select for himself the upper regions, meaning God has no right to keep the heavens for himself. Let us ascend to the sky and wage war with him. Okay, so that's what the rabbis say. The rabbis say that, yes, it doesn't say so explicit in the verse, but why was God so offended that people are making a tower? So the rabbis say, oh, no, no, make no mistake. This is not an innocent tower. It's not like they had no, not enough place to, to live, so they have to build a tower it's because the city is too dense and they want to get the, make, make use of the ear rights. No, they are here to battle with God. That's the first interpretation. Another explanation, they spoke against the sole one of the world, meaning they spoke against God. Another explanation of Dvar Machadim, other editions read Dvar Machadim, sharp words. They said, once every... 1,656 years, the sky totters as it did in the time of the flood. Come and let us and let us make support for it. Okay, the skies are going to fall. Every, every 1,600 years, there's a flood. So we're going to make a building, a tower, and we're going to support the sky. Now, it could be literal. They're going to support the sky. It could mean we'll have a place to run if the flood comes. We'll go really high in the mountain. Whatever the case is, these, these are the two interpretations. But what you see what's happening here is the rabbis are struggling to find the sin in the story. So they add um, the backstory, but the backstory is not written in the story. It's true. I mean, that's the tradition. It's true. But the Torah does not write it. If the Torah would want us to think that to, with the Torah, if, the Torah if, if this was the whole story, the Torah should write it. We want to look at the way the Torah writes the story. And could you see from the story itself their sin or the problem with what they did? And that we can't see the problem explicitly. So that's part of the issue. Why does the Torah sort of hide the reason and, the, and, 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 and why does the Torah not identify clearly what their sin was? Uh, presumably this, the purpose of the story of the story is that we learn from the sin. But if the story is not written explicitly, if the sin is not written explicitly, how could we learn from the story? Okay. So one interesting interpretation is as follows. So the first thing we have to understand is this is a story of the development of modern technology. I know you don't you didn't notice it. It didn't say anything about Apple, app, iPod, uh, whatever number they're up to, 15. But this is a story about modern technology. And of course, the modern technology of the time was none other than the brick, right? If you look back at verse, if you look back at verse um, three, 
it says, they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly. So the bricks were to them for stones. All, and the clay was for them for mortar, which means that um, Rashi says bricks because there were no stones in Babylon, which is a valley. From Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, that's the Medrash. In other words, they said, look, usually we're, how can you build, build a building? You build a building where there's, where there's stone, where there's mountains. You go to Turkey, you go to Israel. There's no mountains in Babylon. You don't build buildings in Babylon. But they say, you know, we can figure out how to manipulate nature. We could take the earth. We could burn the earth. We can make, we can make bricks. And we can build in, um, we, can build, we, can, we can build a tower. And that's what they do. And the rabbis say, technology, be very careful with technology. Because when you have modern technology, what that could ultimately do, it could make you have a war with God. What does that mean? It means, at a minimum, you don't need God's protection anymore. Say, I'm going to support this guy. What does it mean I'm going to support this guy? They think a building is going to support this guy. What they're really saying is, we could, we have no dependence on heaven. With our ingenuity, we can come up with solutions, with technological solutions to solve all our problems. We don't need heaven. We don't need, we don't need anybody. We're independent. We can create our own, we can create our own system of living. We can create our own morality. We're not dependent on anything else. And therefore, the danger is that when man develops modern technology, I don't care if it's the brick or if it's the uh, rover on Mars, person then could think, people can then think, we are, we are, um, we are, we are um, like God. And God, and God says that's dangerous. To have unity, ultimately to have unity, you have to have unity around the true purpose. If it's a, if, if you don't, if, you, if there's no value uniting people, then the unity could be dangerous as we'll be discussed in a minute. But in any case, so that's part of the story. That's, that's one interpretation. And what's beautiful about this interpretation is because it explains why the Torah does not say explicitly what the sin is. Because what do you want the Torah to say? The Torah to say, the sin is they created technology? That's the sin? No, of course not. There's no sin in creating technology. There's a sin in creating technology with no other higher purpose. And that's the other thing the Torah says is they said, let's make the brick, let's make a building. And when they say, let's make a name for ourselves. Okay. So they have a very developed society. They know how to make, build a tower in a place where there's no stones. But what's the purpose of all this? What's the purpose of the development of all this technology? What's the purpose, purpose of, of all this creativity? So what do they say? They say, um, and they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and, and, a tower, and a tower with the top in the heavens and let us make ourselves a name. Make ourselves a name, nothing wrong, but it's something wrong if that's your highest value. If ultimately the whole purpose of society is to build a name for ourselves to, for, to, for, the, for the purpose of advancing the self, then ultimately that leads to idol worship. I'm the idol. And as we know, that's what happened. We know that uh, later with the Torah talks about Nimrod. He was the king who rebelled against, rebelled against Hashem. Ultimately, Nimrod was the king of Babel. Without getting into all the details because of the constraints of time, um, we have here a, uh, a story of technology. Technology is not a sin. Development is not a sin. But if there's no higher purpose, then it becomes very close to ultimately it's destructive. And that's why the, the, the plot falls apart. And it's actually very interesting. One more interpretation, which I said in the past, but I'll say it again. Um, how, did, how did this process of breaking down this God spreading everybody to all over the earth, how did it happen? How did the project break down? So the Medrash, the verse says, God mixed up the languages. They couldn't speak to each other. And the Medrash has this whole thing where God would create, uh, um, where somebody would, a whole description where somebody would ask for a hammer. And because God changed the language, changed the languages, now what I call a hammer is not what you call a hammer. So I ask you for a hammer and you bring me a brick. And I'm so upset that I throw the brick at you and you die. And then we start fighting. That's what the Medrash says. Now the question is, is the Medrash literal or not is another story. But here's an unbelievable interpretation from our good friend, uh, our good friend, our beloved commentator, the Ababernel. Ababernel says like this. He says, everyone spoke Hebrew. Everybody spoke Hebrew. Then they're creating modern inventions. To build a new building in Babylon, you need modern invention. You need brick, you need, but you need many other inventions. What are you going to name the new inventions? Who names the new invention? The, the inventor. Who's the inventor? Oh, the collaboration. The people start fighting, what's the name of this item? What they're really fighting is who gets credit for this invention? 
right? The whole purpose of the building is to make a name for ourselves. So everybody wants their name on it. So everybody is fighting. How do we call this new brick? This new, uh, the, you know, this new creation where you can actually screw something in when you have a nut, you have a bolt. What are you going to call this? It's not in the Holy Tongue. It wasn't, it wasn't, God didn't invent those words. It's not in the Torah. It's not in biblical language. It's response to modern technology, to new creation that the human being creates. So what they're fighting over when, when they can't figure out how to name a hammer, what it's really saying is we can't figure out, um, they can't collaborate because ultimately, if the purpose is to expand the self and there's no other deeper purpose, there's no other value of bettering society, then ultimately it's going to self-destruct. At some point, it's going to self-destruct. So you can read it literally, you can read it figuratively, but that's really the story that what happens over here. I just want to say one more interpretation that I read. It doesn't come from a tr traditional source, but I'll say it anyway. I hope I'm not going to be disbarred. And they say like this. I thought it was interesting, interesting enough to think about it. You have people, the people, what do you have in this story? You have a tower going up to heaven. And then God is nervous and God says, now, what's the word I'm going to use? It? I'm, going to, I'm going to show you this word twice, this word twice. Um, they said, they said, come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in heavens and let us make ourselves a name, lest we be scattered upon the face of the earth. Pen nafuts, lest we be scattered, nafuts. Let's keep reading. God changes their plan. He mixes up the languages. The Lord scattered them. Vayafetz. Vayafetz. The Lord scattered them from there upon the face of the entire earth, and they cease building the city. Okay, fine. Okay. One of the ways to get meaning from the Torah, uh, the modern scholars think it's new, but it's not really new. It's really old, because in the Torah, one of the ways you do is compare, compare words. So some, some of what the modern scholars like to do is compare stories. And they ask, where else do you have in Torah a story that's similar to a tower going up to heaven? Anybody? This is a uh, trivia. Don't be shy. In the meantime, I'll look for it inside. But in the meantime, if anybody wants to guess, what's, think about, the, I'll give you a hint. It's in Genesis. Think about the stories of Genesis. When you think about a tower going up to heaven, some scene in the Torah with something going up to heaven. The ladder, Jacob's ladder. Oh, I knew we have a biblical scholar here. Jacob's ladder. So thank God um, uh, you gave me enough time to find Jacob's ladder. And I think we'll find it. Okay. It's in a nutshell. Here, Torah reading. So we have Jacob is running away from his brother, running away from Israel. He comes to, to, uh, to, to the place which we think is the temple. According to the sages, it's the place of a temple mountain. Uh, verse 12. And he dreamt, and behold, the ladder set up on the ground, and its top reached to heaven. And behold, angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. Okay, very different ladder. This is a ladder that the human being is trying to go, and uh, uh, a tower, the human being is trying to fight God. Or in other words, represent their superiority. We're able to, to, we don't need God, we can build our own towers, we can build our own technology to protect ourselves. And this is a very different ladder. This is a, a ladder that brings you closer to God. So it's the contrast. It's the similarity which highlights the contrast. Okay, what happens in the next verse? So if you're a Chabad person, you know that the Chabad anthem is what? The famous song, You should burst forth uh, west, east, north, and south. That's the Chabad anthem. The Rebbe, the Rebbe spoke about that verse many times in the 50s, and somebody came from Israel with this song, and it became the Chabad anthem. And, and, and uparatsta, 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 that's the Chabad song. To the extent that there was a there's a, a famous lawyer, a criminal defense lawyer. What's his name? Um, what's his name in New York? What's his name? Uh, um, what's his name? Forget his name. Um, with a B. Forget his name. In any case, he grew up when he was a kid. He grew up and he lived at 788 Eastern Parkway, next door to 770. And they brought him to the conference of Shlochem one year to the Kinnis of Shlochem. Maybe maybe Andy was there that year. And he spoke about how it was to grow up next door to 770. And he said it was terrible. All night they would hear, Ufarazda, Ufarazda. That's all they sang. And the Rebbe's Fabrengans, that's what the song, that's what the song they sang. This is a verse that we get from, from um, this is a verse that we get from God speaking to Jacob at the scene of the ladder going up to heaven. What does he say? And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall gain strength. Gain strength is, is translation. Parazda means to burst forward. East, westward, eastward, northward, and southward, and through you shall be blessed all the families of the earth and through your seed. Okay. 
Okay, so what is the similarity here and the contrast? You have the tower going up to heaven. You have the ladder going up to heaven. But in the story of the tower, what is it that the people want? People say, pen nafuts, we shouldn't be scattered. Now, the word nafuts, I wish I could show you both words, but I think I could. The word nafuts, um, vayafets, what is the root? Feit sadik. Paratsta. Paratsta is paid tzaddik, is the two letters of the root. Two of three letter, root letters are the same. In other words, it's very clear that what God is telling Jacob is the opposite of what the people wanted. People wanted a tower, and they wanted to be united around the tower. Why, why is unity a problem? Maybe it will take 10 seconds to address that. But God is saying that's only a tower that represents human might. But if you're talking about a tower that uh, going up to heaven to connect to God, then the response is not necessarily being all in one place, but to the contrary, you have to scatter to all directions, east, west, north, south. But what's happening here? What's happening here is ultimately, when you came to that tower, and if you're talking about a tower about human might, ultimately, what really happened here, especially if you read the Medrash, I'm not going to get into it right now, there's always the king on top. There's always the person on top of this tower. And it was Nimrod that was the king. And Nimrod says, I don't want everyone to scatter. I want everyone here. Why? Because I want everyone serving me. In other words, ultimately, ultimately, the powers that be in this process of building the tower to aggrandize man is there's somebody on top saying, I need everyone to be here. I need everyone under me. I need everyone working for me. The other story, if we're connected to God, if we're holy, if we understand, if we truly understand the relationship to God, then we can scatter to all four corners of the earth to bring the divine message to everybody because we understand that we can find God everywhere and we can bring God to everywhere. So it's a mirror story. It's the exact opposites. And it helps us under, understand the mistake of the people who built the tower because there they say, we want to we want, we, we want, we want be united. We have to be, to connect to the unity, we have to be in one place. That's a mistake. If you're connected to God, you can find that unity wherever you go in all directions. So there's a lot more to say, but I think uh, I think I think we I think the clock is 11:01. So we'll continue the discussion next year, same time, in good health. Uh, comments, questions, of course, always welcome. Thank you everybody for joining. Have a wonderful day, and don't forget to go into the ark, make go into the word, go into the ark, make get that spiritual protection every morning, and then you'll realize that the flood is really raising you higher, and that's the takeaway that we can always we'll always go back to. So. I hope this is uh, meaningful for everybody. Uh, wonderful day, and we'll see each other in good health. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.